started that are continuing to roll in, but um, given that it's just a little bit past the hour, we'll, we'll go ahead and start the webinar. Um, I'm Avalon Bristow, Program Manager at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean and Co-Coordinator for MACAN. Today, we're really excited to host our two co-presenters, Dr. Sarah Cooley and Beth Turner, on state and federal ocean acidification policy in action. But before we get to that, switch slides here. Wanted to let you know that this is the first webinar in our fourth series. The next one will be focused on surf clam response to ocean acidification and is scheduled for February 12th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. We'll be sending out a regist registration link for that shortly. The three following will be monthly, but we're still working on finalizing a date for each one. So stay tuned. Um, the topics are listed here. If you're interested and wanna um, keep these in mind, we're gonna be doing one in March that will be an industry perspectives on ocean acidification. Um, in April, we're gonna look at ocean acidification action planning. And in May, we'll be doing a webinar on the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program National and Mid-Atlantic Research Plan. As a reminder, all the webinar recordings are posted to uh, our website at midacan.org slash webinars. As I mentioned previously, Drs. Uh, Sarah Cooley and Beth Turner will be presenting today. Just a brief uh, overview of, of their bios here. Dr. Sarah Cooley is the Director of the Ocean Acidification Program at Ocean Conservancy in Washington, D.C. She's been working to incorporate science into decision-making at Ocean Conservancy since 2014. She works to educate and engage decision-makers and stakeholders from every political perspective at regional to international levels on ocean acidification, identifying ways that different groups can take concrete, stepwise action on the issue. In her work, Dr. Cooley combines science synthesis, strategic communications, political strategy, and advocacy, and public advocacy. She'll present specifically on federal policy action on ocean acidification, and she'll be our first presenter. Dr. Beth Turner is an oceanographer and program manager at the Competitive Research Program in the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, National Ocean Service at NOAA. In this position, she manages research projects that focus on developing understanding and predictive capabilities for coastal management issues, such as hypoxia, shoreline modification, ocean acidification, and fisheries ecosystems. She has been active in the NOAA Ecological Forecasting Roadmap and the NOAA North Atlantic Regional Team. Beth was trained as a biological oceanographer and benthic ecologist and holds degrees from Texas Christian University, SUNY at Stony Brook, and University of Delaware, where she received her PhD. She did postdoctoral work at Rutgers University and the University of Maryland. Prior to joining NOAA, Beth worked at the National Research Council Ocean Studies Board and the Office of Naval Research. Beth is a founding member of the steering committee of the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, NECAN, and chairs a management and policy working group. She will present specifically on state efforts on coastal acidification in the Northeast US. And just um, to kind of tag off of that a little bit as a reminder, this is a joint webinar that NECAN and NECAN are putting on together. We will have about 20 minutes at the end of the presentation for any questions and comments. Um, we will also open up uh, for questions at the, at the end of the first presentation from Dr. Sarah Cooley, um, if there's any immediate questions after her presentation, and then there will be another opportunity at the very end. All participants will be muted, so please ask your questions via the question box. Anthony Himes, PhD student at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and, Vir and Vir the Virginia Sea Grant Fellow assisting MACAN with efforts, will be collating the questions to ask at the end of the presentation, um, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MACAN website, as I mentioned before. It will be on the resource page with our previous webinar series. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Cooley. Thanks, Avalon. Good morning, everybody. I am Sarah Cooley. I am the um, the director of the ocean acidification program at ocean conservancy and i hope right now what you're seeing is my initial slide page did i do that correctly avalon looks like it thank you okay um today i'll be talking to you a little bit about um what uh is happening at the federal landscape on ocean acidification policy um, first, a bit about Ocean Conservancy. So Ocean Conservancy is a nonprofit organization or a, a, a non-governmental organization, NGO, 
um, and we're dedicated to ocean conservation. Our mission statement is that we are working with you to protect the ocean from today's greatest global challenges. Together, we create science-based solutions for a healthy ocean and the wildlife and communities that depend on that. And we've been working on ocean acidification since about 2012. Um, I've been the science part of the ocean acidification program since about 2014. Um, before that, I was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution researching the human dimensions of ocean acidification using multidisciplinary numerical models and data sets. Um, in the federal space, um, we do a lot of work on ocean acidification. Um, we also do some international, um, regional, and state policy well, which I won't talk about today, but I'd be happy to um, chat with uh, any of you about that at a later date. We also do stakeholder cultivation and engagement, um, strategic communications and science synthesis that complements our policy work. Um, and so we see communication, science, and policy work as three legs of a stool that support our program. Um, today, I'll be focusing just on the federal portion. So there's two main efforts that we focus on um, in terms of the federal work on acidification. First, we look at um, how we can boost federal funding or appropriations for ocean acidification work federally. Um, what this includes is um, basic research on ocean acidification science. This also includes um, efforts dedicated to um, water chemistry and monitoring of water quality, and also education and outreach. Um, we do a lot of educating members of Congress about the, scientific, the state of the science and um, where the um, next frontiers are so that the uh, members of Congress who basically write the checks that support this effort um, can actually see their way forward to supporting it more as the issue grows um, in our understanding and also in our needs to um, continue. We also work on federal ocean acidification legislation and I'll talk a little bit about each of those things but first I'll give you a little bit of history. So um, in the 2000s um, episodic ocean acidification was identified on the West Coast as a driver of higher uh, rates of larval oyster death. And um, in 2015, Alan Barton put an article in Oceanography magazine, which tells the story really nicely if you want to dig in. Um, the brief version is that after larval failures in the mid-2000s, um, the Pacific shellfish hatchery industry partnered with regional scientists to put in place intensive carbon chem carbonate chemistry monitoring. And then they also worked with the Washington State Senator Maria Cantwell's office to implement monitoring stations region-wide and to create the California Current Acidification Network, or CCAN, and build out the research industry partnerships to get more answers. So in federal policy, um, the issue really began um, in 2005 um, in federal legislation and then there was a National Academy study to focus on you know what did we know what do we need to know and then in 2009 the Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act or FORAM was passed and um, in 2009 uh, it's interesting to consider that there were only seven co-sponsors in the Senate and five in the House of this bill so the bill got passed as part of an omnibus focused on the lands and land issues because acidification hadn't been heard of by hardly anyone and um, it, it kind of made good uh, political sense to kind of roll it up together with other things. Um, so in that, initial, uh, in that initial piece of legislation, the federal ocean acidification effort was funded. The NOAA Ocean Acidification Program was put together, um, but it wasn't funded to the level requested. Um, also in 2007, we saw the first congressional testimony by the first generation of ocean acidification communicators. Um, in science, there was a dedicated call supported by the National Science Foundation to research um, the basics of acidification. Um, there was a concerted effort in Europe and in UK and in Germany to study the issue. Um, and uh, at the same time, the shellfish growers uh, working with scientists in the Pacific Northwest were expanding the monitoring network. So we have all these kind of, this initial federal response. It's very heavily focused on just understanding the parameters of acidification. 
So one of the requirements of the Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act, or FORAM, is that it required several federal scientific agencies to participate in an interagency working group on acidification. Many other agencies who aren't specifically named in FORAM also participate because they have interests in OA monitoring or in impacts. So here's the current list of groups that are involved, and it's much broader than the initial sort of NOAA, NSF, um, and NASA that I believe are named in 4AM. 4AM also contains some reporting requirements for the interagency working group. Um, first, the group had to develop a strategic plan and periodically it has to provide updates on how each agency is committing resources to support observations, monitoring, and research. And um, it's important to note that you, the new strategic plan covering 2020 to 2030 is being drafted right now. So that may ring some vague bells in this community um, for the um, public comment request that went out around Thanksgiving for information on that. And so um, in 4M also, uh, this bill also recommended funding levels for NSF and NOAA for the first four years. It's in the two agencies, oh, it was only just NSF and NOAA that were called out, and um, they were recommended to begin with a to total of $14 million, rising to $35 million by 2013. And so for NOAA, the portion would be $8 million to start and in 2010, and rising to $20 million by 2013. And so the progress under 4AM, under that initial charge, um, has been very significant. We have 10 years of research under our belts now, and that has also um, uh, been uh, um, dovetailed with observing efforts around North America and elsewhere. So the map on the upper left just gives you a sense of where um, assets are located uh, that are run by NOAA. <clears throat> to um, continue the monitor and extend the monitoring network. Um, on the upper right, you can see how NOAA views all the pieces of the um, federal ocean acidification work uh, fitting together with uh, monitoring and technology also going hand in hand with research on biological responses, um, modeling, um, education and outreach, understanding of how uh, socioeconomic systems intersect with um, impacts from acidification, and then management of all that data. Um, most recently, uh, the, the work has uh, begun the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange, which is um, kind of a community uh, networking site where folks with a, an interest in acidification, um, generally researchers and um, stakeholders like industry stakeholders, policymakers can all um, be part of this and engage in discussions and updates about what's happening in the field. Um, so it's a really neat way to help foster focused conversation about what's happening now and where we need to go. So in addition to 4M, I also explained that there are um, things called message bills or small pieces of legislation that uh, members of Congress will um, be involved in. And they are very interested in these message bills because the, it allows uh, each member to kind of put a personal uh, stamp on things and say, I'm really interested in this issue from the lens of perhaps it's community vulnerability or perhaps it's coral reef health or perhaps it's technological development. And so these message bills that they develop are small pieces of legislation that really speak to a gap in research or in funding or coordination or maybe even regulations and they're tied to ocean acidification and sort of mindful of the federal enterprise uh, working on acidification that has been set up by 4M. And a lot of times these message bills are put together in consultation with science and management experts and sometimes adv advocacy groups too. So members of Congress who introduce and co-sponsor these message bills really want to call attention to OA in a way that matters to their community. And the message bills have turned out to be a safe space for members of Congress on both sides of the aisle to come together and take a stand. Um, in addition, uh, members can also work um, in the appropriations process or they can engage in advocating for um, strong funding, and so that that ties into the appropriations work and advocacy that we do. 
And um, we work with Congress to make sure that the, and, and these members of Congress who are interested in acidification, to make sure that the OA research activity in the U.S. receives consistent and sustained funding each year. And you know, it's interesting because this opportunity and this strategy was completely invisible to me before I started working at Ocean Conservancy. Um, so what we do is we provide a pathway for issue experts. So it might be scientists or industry leaders or professional organizations um, and, and uh, resource managers to let their representatives in Congress know that this issue is important to them. And so we work with the congressional offices to educate them on what is this issue and why do your constituents care about it? How is it relevant in your corner of the world? And then we um, help organize these dear colleague letters that go from these groups of Congress people who have heard from their constituencies um, and then their members, and then these members of Congress will write to their own colleagues in the House and Senate Appropriations Committee. So they put sort of sideways pressure on their peers and provide advice on the budgeting process. Kind of, you know, here's what I heard from my constituents and here's how this matters to your work as an appropriator. And then we also make sure to kind of thank folks who are taking a stand on the certification for their hard work at you know during appropriations and also throughout the year um, because members of congress like to be like to hear when they're doing a good job they don't always want to hear people screaming at them for not doing the right thing so that's been a remarkably effective mix of things and over um, the past several years since fy13 um, the acidification um, appropriations for the NOAA program have more than doubled. So they've gone from $6 million in FY13 and 14 to $14 million for FY20, which was just uh, settled on in the last few months. And this is really um, a remarkable feat for an issue that is sort of this invisible niche issue that kind of came out of carbon cycle science um, and it affects you know, a very specific industry. And I think it really speaks to the power of activating voices of people who are experts, who have reason to be concerned, and engaging in sort of a sober, clear-eyed conversation about what sort of science we need and where we need to go with it. Um, at the same time this last year, in June, the House passed bipartisan acidification legislation for the first time in 10 years. So that's the first time since the 4M bill passed, anything on OA has passed. Um, this really, again, shows that there are champions uh, thinking about ocean acidification on both sides of the aisle, and that acidification is a sensible and a safe environmental issue to engage on that still needs attention. And that's actually pretty important considering the emotional baggage and sort of hot button issue that we find um, climate change to be. Um, we have had members be able to say acidification research sounds like an important thing to do um, and, and they, don't get, they don't get heat for it. So that's really important. So just briefly, um, each of these bills, um, the first one that, that it mentioned here, the Coast Research Act of 2019 reauthorizes 4M and it updates recommended funding levels, but it also broadens the scope of work on acidification better to um, include the coastal zone because that's what we know is relevant now after 10 years of work. Um, the Coastal Communities Ocean Acidification Act of 2019 um, says that the federal government should assess the needs of coastal community vulnerability to acidification and make sure that research and monitoring plans are influenced by those needs assessments. Um, the Ocean Acidification Innovation Act allows several agencies to establish competitions to award prizes for innovation. Um, that's sort of like in the X Prize model. Um, and then the NEAR Act of 2019 um, would authorize the National Academies of Science to examine the impact of acidification and other stressors on estuaries and near shore waters. And this is important because after 10 years of federal investments, we know a whole lot about how acidification interacts with certain coastal processes like runoff and erosion and upwelling. And it's really difficult to measure its impact in estuarine environments. But this study by the National Academies would help compile everything we know and identify where the knowledge gaps are greatest. And so we can, um, as a community, direct future investments to help resolve those questions that would best help nearshore water and land managers prepare for acidification and build resilience in a very sort of applied focused way on the resources that are um, 
you know, mattering to uh, local communities. In the Senate, there have also been two OA bills that have been introduced, but they have not moved um, to committee, well, they've not moved through committee or to a vote. So uh, the Ocean Research Act is a companion to the reauthorization bill for 4 um, And then the other bill, the Coastal Communities Bill, um, again, it, it's similar to the um, H.R. 1716 that I mentioned, where it asks NOAA to conduct an update um, ocean acidification community vulnerability assessments. And so it really just kind of uh, zeroes in on the fact that acidification needs to be a human focused um, concern when it comes to the, the application of what we know. So um, this is an interesting um, slide that uh, I'll walk you through and it gives, it gives us reason to be hopeful here. Um, in 2009, when 4M was introduced, it only had, as I remember, as I told you before, it had seven co-sponsors in the Senate and five in the House. And the bill became part of law as part, as, as part of an omnibus. So it, it kind of like took a, a bit of a circuitous path to get to um, in, into law. And then in the uh, 2017 and 18, the, the, pri the previous congressional session to what we're in now, um, we've had 107 members in both chambers that have either co-sponsored bills or advocated publicly for strong funding. And so that, that gives us a much bigger base of support um, that recognizes that this is an issue that of our times that needs attention. And so um, all of the community's work in um, communicating the uh, advances from acidification research and future needs and the relevance to human communities is all making sure that this is comprehensible by people outside of the scientific community and it's relevant. Um, so that's been a very exciting um, sort of growth to be following and to be working with. Um, so just briefly, um, if you want to get involved in any of this or learn more, um, you're welcome to send me a message or follow me on Twitter. Um, we also have an, a newsletter called The Nexus, and it just follows the convergence of acidification, science, communications, and policy. And we send that out quarterly. We're about to send out a new one in the next few days uh, once we get it um, put together. And then, um, actually, that's a really old bullet. I apologize. Um, we have done blogs in the past for a focus on NOAA budget and federal appropriations processes. And if you would like to find that specific post, I'd be happy to help you find it um, because it's no longer at the top. Um, thank you again to Makan and Nikan for organizing this. Um, and I'm happy to answer quick, urgent questions now. Um, but then if we want to do some deeper discussion, I would love to carry that until the end. Um, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I don't see any urgent questions. Um, I'll give people a little bit of time to do that. Um, we did have one question asking if your slides will be available anywhere um, after your presentation. You know, um, I think Macan is recording this. Is that true? Yes, that's true. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the Macan website um, mm -hmm. if anybody wants to look back at it later. Sure, and then I'm happy to, um, you know, share the slides um, person to person. So you can always send me an email if you'd like that too. Oh, and we did have another quick question now come in. Um, of the 23 Republicans helping to sponsor the bills, how many are coastal versus inland? Um, most of them are coastal. Um, we have a very strong showing in Florida. Um, there's definitely a, um, a culture of care for the ocean. Uh, from Florida citizens and uh, constituents. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head the locations of every single supporter, but they do by and large skew coastal. Um, and that is something that we are um, hoping to uh, continue to change. Okay, great. Um, that looks like all of the urgent questions, but if anyone has anything else, feel free to drop them in the question okay. box and we can um, answer them at the end. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Beth Turner. Thanks, Beth, over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, congratulations on um, all of that great work that you've been doing. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. Are you uh, seeing my title slide here? Yes, we are. Okay, great. 
Um, I'm going to um, pick up from Sarah and talk about uh, more local efforts in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. And as Avalon mentioned, um, we're a joint NECAN and MACAN uh, webinar. Um, so NECAN kind of covers the uh, Northeast states from Maine to New York, and MACAN covers the uh, states from uh, New York down to Virginia. So there's a little bit of overlap in New York. Um, I'm going to give you a little background on the Northeast region um, and then move into some of the legislative efforts. Uh, as you all know, there's a whole lot of states in this region, um, and there is, this is, of course, the um, highly developed urban corridor on the East Coast, um, but there's a lot of really rural and economically disadvantaged areas as well. Uh, this graphic is from a publication in 2015 that looked at vulnerability to acidification, uh, both in terms of the chemistry of the waters and their dependence on calcifying species and their economic and social um, ability to react. And um, you'll see a lot of red there in the region, um, down East Maine uh, in the uh, furthest uh, eastern area, and then in the blowout of um, pretty much all of Massachusetts and Connecticut uh, and Long Island and uh, southern New Jersey. And this is because of, there's a whole variety of co-stressors that happen in these areas um, with temperature increases, eutrophication, harmful algal blooms, pollutants, uh, river runoff, and a high dependence on calcifying species. And uh, if you look at this in more detail, um, New Bedford in 2017 had um, 111 million pounds of scallops, uh, valued at 389 million. Maine lobster, of course, is a huge industry, um, 2018 numbers there. Um, 2016, which was the last numbers I could find from the Mid-Atlantic Bight region, uh, with sea scallops, blue crab, and eastern oyster being 56% of the total revenues, um, uh, which makes up 448 million. Uh, 2018 value for Virginia shellfish, 58 million. And Virginia is first in the US for hard clam production and uh, first on the East Coast for oyster production um, and aquaculture. Um, so big numbers, lots of economic impact. Um, but moreover, there's a huge social and historical um, connection to these industries as well. Uh, the lobster fishery, of course, is uh, synonymous with Maine in a lot of people's minds. Um, the scallop for uh, New Bedford, uh, the oyster for Chesapeake Bay, um, hard clams in New Jersey waters. Um, so these are, are uh, impacts beyond economic and really go to the fabric of society as well in a lot of these coastal communities. Um, because there's a lot of states and because um, they are uh, close to each other, uh, there's a lot of joint planning and especially in spatial planning and in water quality management. Uh, there are marine spatial planning efforts that um, happened in New England and in the Mid-Atlantic. Each one of those regions has a regional ocean plan. Uh, these fostered regional collaboration, um, they are uh, currently heavily weighted towards wind farm siting. Um, this is uh, really a huge issue for both the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, um, how to uh, use offshore resources uh, and not um, have overlapping areas where we're trying to exploit things. Uh, on water quality, a lot of state agencies have um, uh, groups that work together to try and uh, span these political boundaries. Um, EPA standards apply across state boundaries, um, but there's a lot of joint work and, and this is exemplified by the Chesapeake Bay program in the Mid-Atlantic, um, which has a huge organizational structure within itself um, and, and several goal implementation teams um, for various things, but it's uh, basically a water quality program and how water quality impacts all of those things. So a lot of things going on in the region, a lot of uh, state efforts and a lot of uh, ways to coordinate that. 
so it's against this kind of background that uh, a lot of OA work has happened. And there's been several state commissions that have developed reports on ocean and coastal acidification. Uh, most states in the region have either completed reports, which is at the top of the list there, or have reports in progress. And there's several common themes that emerge. Um, everybody wants more monitoring. Um, everybody thinks that there should be more research, especially on key economic species. Uh, most people recognize that we have to do a better job of managing the coast stressors. Um, there's a lot of uh, interest in mitigation and, and adaptation options. Um, everybody wants to be able to communicate and do outreach and um, coordinate with other efforts. Interestingly, um, only two of the reports mention directly reducing carbon dioxide emissions, and that's Maine and New Jersey. So I'm going to do a little case study of Maine. Um, this was a commission that was formed in 2014 uh, with a timeline to develop a report by 2015. Uh, which they did, um, and their uh, conclusions were they wanted to invest uh, in monitoring. Um, here's this reduce emissions piece. Um, they wanted to reduce land-based nutrients uh, input into the coastal ocean, increase the capacity for mitigation, remediation, and adaptation. Um, and, and here's the inform piece, and, and just maintaining a sustained and coordinated focus on ocean acidification. Now this uh, bill to form the commission um, happened under a, a Republican governor, and it passed without his signature. Um, so he didn't actively veto it, but he also didn't actively support it. And after the report was uh, put forth, there was no real legislative um, appetite to do anything about it. So um, in response, there was a volunteer effort that formed called the Maine Ocean and Coastal Acidification Partnership, or MOCA, uh, which was formed to implement recommendations of the study commission and uh, to help coordinate work and, and interface with uh, interested legislators um, who may not have the political cover to actually do anything about it at that time. And they set out a series of ambitious goals for themselves um, to be a forum to, for coordinating efforts, um, to have a, a really uh, robust communication effort, um, to support regulatory approaches um, and inform elected officials, and provide updates on, on uh, recent work. Now, I should mention that MOCA um, included state legislators um, in the partnership itself. Um, so this was not a group kind of working, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, outside of the, well, it was working outside the legislature, but it had uh, legislative representatives in it. So there was a, a connection to the legislature, even though this was not a formally recognized legislative body. And uh, one of the most important things that they did was was have these regular meetings that uh, gave an update on what activities were happening, um, to uh, talk about opportunities, and to discuss uh, new science findings and, and changing priorities. So um, that was until 2018. And then in 2018, there was a new governor elected, Janet Mills. Um, and the political environment changed, and suddenly climate was at the top of uh, Governor Mills' uh, agenda. And so in November 2018, almost directly after the election, uh, the MOCA advisory group met with the Maine Coastal Caucus, which is a bipartisan group of legislators from uh, coastal regions. And uh, during the summer of uh, 2019, they hosted uh, three stakeholder discussion groups to talk about research and monitoring, policy and law, and resiliency and adaptation, and how the legislature could move forward on these items. And they collated these and uh, synthesized it into an action plan, which uh, the MOCA then forwarded to these legislators on the Maine Coastal Caucus. And uh, Governor Mills, um, at that time, was forming a, a larger effort uh, called the Maine Climate Council. 
Uh, and that group has kind of um, taken over a lot of the planning for actions to deal with ocean acidification. The Climate Council has several subcommittees. It's a much larger effort than just um, acidification efforts or uh, marine efforts, but there is a coastal and marine working group, and that's where the ocean acidification portfolio fits within right now. Um, so Maine is an example of where the issue had to kind of um, uh, simmer for a while, um, and now it's, it's directly input into a larger effort going on at the statewide level. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples from New Jersey and Maryland as well, because they took a slightly different approach. Uh, in New Jersey, their report was from a science advisory board that gave recommendations to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. So it wasn't a state group itself, it was an advisory group to a state agency. Um, again, lots of recommendations to enhance monitoring. Um, here's our CO2 reductions again. And perhaps that's a direct result of the fact that it's not a governmental group, it's a group outside the government providing advice, so maybe they felt more free to be able to talk about carbon uh, emissions there. Um, the, they talked about best management practices for nutrient reduction and, and impervious surfaces uh, runoff, and uh, wanted to have a lot of outreach to the affected industries. Uh, in Maryland, it is a state agency report. Um, there were some specific recommendations for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, they wanted to enhance and coordinate monitoring um, and cooperation with affected industries. They've got some research priorities identified, um, and they wanted the DNR to be the lead in establishing an uh, interagency working group. And here's an example of where the Chesapeake Bay program um, comes into play where Maryland um, has a, a clear idea that they should be engaging the Chesapeake Bay Commission and the Chesapeake Bay Program. So a little bit of um, comparison between the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, Sarah mentioned that uh, a lot of the national efforts were spurred by what was happening on the West Coast, and that was recognized as a direct regional threat. OA was seen as a direct threat to this very large and established aquaculture industry. Um, on the East Coast, um, these efforts came after uh, that had happened, so um, they were informed by a lot of these West Coast efforts. But the industry, uh, especially the aquaculture industry on the East Coast, is uh, growing, and it's mostly small individual aquaculture operations rather than large um, operations as they are on the West Coast. On the West Coast, there's only three states, um, so uh, the interstate communication was a little bit easier, and uh, the whole effort was actually multi-state from the beginning. On the East Coast, it's uh, very much a state-by-state -state approach through the nine states. On the West Coast, um, really the lead was the governor's offices uh, developing this uh, blue ribbon panel, whereas on the East Coast, it's more a grassroots state-by-state uh, uh, -state kind of thing. Uh, and so the, the top town political will was present on the West Coast from the outset and uh, has to be fostered in, in each state uh, on the East Coast. Uh, the implementation of the uh, actions that come out of this are through uh, individual states um, potentially coordinating, but uh, maybe there's more accountability there, maybe there's a little more visibility on these actions. Um, on the East Coast, um, again, the implementation is through individual states. It's a little unclear um, what those ultimate actions are going to be. So just as a summary, um, in the East Coast, we've got approaches that are unique to each state. Um, there's a focus on local resources and economic uh, and community aspects. Um, several recommendations are similar across the states. Um, support from governor's offices vary by state and can change with administration changes, and those changes may be more uh, nimble than um, some of the national uh, political change. Uh, there's a lot of engagement with state agencies, uh, and some uh, states mention cross-state collaborations. And for uh, the CANs, for MAYCAN and NECAN, I think that this really opens up a lot of opportunity 
to help with coordination across the states and to provide information products that are specific to uh, each region. So in support of that, uh, one of the things that NACAN and NACAN, NACAN have been working on are uh, these conceptual models of uh, coastal acidification and the drivers that, uh, that are important in each one of the uh, subregions. Uh, and this, this we called VOCAL, Visualizing Ocean and Coastal Acidification Locally. And down at the bottom of the slides, you see the, the two websites for uh, the New England on the left and the Mid-Atlantic on the right. Um, there's a kind of a common uh, theme to the graphics, but uh, there are regional um, differences in, in terms of how these uh, different drivers are expressed. And we also, on the right-hand side of each one of those, you'll see the, the nighttime um, uh, bar. Uh, because we wanted to emphasize that uh, these changes happen um, on a daily basis as well as um, on a seasonal and, and annual basis. And then we've also um, started working on a policy sheet of information um, of actions that can, can help um, in terms of coastal acidification. And uh, this is, is still a draft. We've got some uh, comments that we're responding to, but uh, the basic idea is to um, have the contributors that um, affect uh, acidification, a brief discussion of what each one of those drivers does, and then um, can anything be done about it? And then what, what policy actions might um, apply to each one of those drivers? So thank you very much. Um, uh, here's our websites, the vocal sites for New England, Mid-Atlantic and Policy, and um, my email to follow up with any questions. And um, I want to uh, say how, how great it is to have these joint NECAN and MACAN webinars, and hopefully we'll be able to do some more in the future. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, we do have some questions that have been rolling in and everyone can feel free to keep them coming if they have any more. Um, we did have um, a request for you, Beth, to show the Virginia specific data from one of your early slides. Um, I think it pertained to like landing data. And... Uh, you mean go back to? Yeah, if you could go back. We had a request to see that again. Uh, that, uh, like I said, that was not the most recent. Uh, yeah, so is this the one? Um, I think so. Um, yeah, they just requested to see the Virginia specific data from the beginning. Um, but then moving into the other questions that we've received, um, there was one a uh, question talking about um, Bloom Brothers, who are the largest oyster producers um, in the Northeast in Connecticut, and talking about how the state of Connecticut doesn't require them to release any of their, or report any of their landing data, but if there's kind of a way to work with them um, to kind of explain how um, showing that data maybe to scientists and other stakeholders could be important, but also kind of how you work that in to show that it would be to their benefit to help share that data and could help them um, in the future. Do you have any yeah, thoughts on that? Um, that is a great idea. Um, you will notice that Connecticut is one of the states that does not have uh, an ocean acidification uh, commission. And uh, Connecticut has been a bit of a uh, outlier in that respect. Um, we have some good uh, connections through our um, through the NECAN Management and Policy Working Group um, to uh, some folks in the state agencies, but there's very little appetite within the state as a whole, I think, um, to focus on this as an issue. And I, I think that may be because um, you know, Long Island Sound is uh, extremely uh, driven by pollutants and hypoxia issues. Um, and so I think that they've kind of got everything they can handle <laughs> just with those issues. Um, so we haven't made a lot of headway on, on specific um, acidification actions in Connecticut. Um, 
but yes, reaching out to the Bloom Brothers is a great idea and um, one that um, I hope we can pursue. Yeah, this is Sarah. I'll just add a note. Um, yeah, the, the numbers that are generally available are only those federally, uh, you know, uh, accumulated numbers. So it doesn't reflect um, those privately owned and state landed um, numbers a lot of the time. And that's actually a really important nuance that the impacts that are presented here are sort of low estimates. And there's a couple of reasons for why that data are reported differently. Um, you know, there's there's actually laws in place to protect confidentiality um, so that uh, you cannot zero in on shellfish landings from a specific place um, beyond a certain point. This is something we found when we did this study led by Julie Ekstrom a number of years ago. We tried to get that information um, and then at some point the law prevents um, anyone having uh, information where you could, you know, theoretically figure out how much a competitor was was producing. Um, you know, the laws are in place to kind of protect um, business, um, uh, you know, trade secrets and stuff, but um, there are ways to um, activate the community and I think, you know, direct outreach to the major growers and kind of explaining like, hey, you know what, this is an issue to plan for the future um, has been very effective in other places. So I totally second Beth's idea of like, yes, we would, it would be wonderful to, to reach out and develop a relationship with that business because they are such a big factor in the area. Okay, great. Um, we did have a few comments come in from Katie O'Brien Clayton saying that Connecticut now does require reporting and that their group is working on some of those relationships. Um, so our next question was to both presenters um, and it's as data and research is being conducted relating to ocean acidification and shellfish, how have citizen science efforts been utilized to increase data or make policy impacts um, and if you know of any specific examples of that. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm so excited that you asked that. I don't know who asked that, but um, yeah, so, um, and I'm really glad that Katie is on as well, um, because Katie was really instrumental in some of these efforts. Um, this past summer, um, NECAN helped to sponsor what we called Shell Day, which was a group of uh, citizen scientists um, that were involved with water quality monitoring organizations and uh, we wanted to see if they could add um, uh, taking bottle samples for total alkalinity and uh, we had a uh, great response from them we had a series of workshops to help engage these uh, water quality monitoring groups um, at the local level um, we developed the um, idea of shell day which happened in august um, Everybody went out on the same day. It was kind of this monitoring blitz. Everybody went out um, for a, a high tide, uh, well, for a tidal cycle, and uh, took measurements at high tide, low tide, uh, mid tide, and um, got all these bottle samples. Um, we uh, were able to support uh, several local uh, academic institutions and labs to analyze those. Uh, that analysis is underway now. Um, and so, yeah, it was really exciting and a whole lot of work and um, uh, yet to see what those results look like, but um, it's going to be really inter interesting to uh, look at the total alkalinity salinity relationships um, over a tidal cycle from Connecticut all the way up to down East Maine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really wonderful example that Beth shared. Um, we're still sort of learning how to make most powerful use of citizen science efforts. And that's a really great example of one that was received wonderfully and has generated some really awesome information. Yeah, we're really excited to see what those results might show. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be circling back to the monitoring groups um, with, uh, once we have uh, information to share with them from the results um, and we're, we are trying to entrain any of those groups who might be interested in helping analyze the data as well. So, um, you know, we're trying to maintain those uh, um, communication lines as we go along. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we do have some more questions coming in. Um, one of them um, was kind of asking if localized efforts to reduce OA um, will, if you guys think they'll still be um, impactful and effective if there's no worldwide endeavor to kind of curb ocean acidification? I think we need both. Um, local efforts are useful in places where you have um, physical oceanography that reduces <clears throat> flushing. Um, so in, in bays uh, where we've seen culture of uh, kelp at the, in the same place as uh, shellfish, um, there have been some early indications that there could be some local benefit. Um, however, that's you know kind of a very localized thing, and it depends heavily on that surrounding oceanographic environment. Um, but we do need um, we do need you know both at the same time, and I think the usefulness of local efforts is that it gives um, it gives a place to begin. It gives local governments and um, you know uh, people you know with that sort of local um, uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, it gives them it gives them an important step to take, and then the next step can be more ambitious, and then the next step after that can be more ambitious. So um, I'm a firm advocate for for all of the above. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Sarah on that. Um, the other thing that um, the local efforts are helpful for is it shows that this coastal acidification in particular is not happening uh, in a vacuum. Um, you know, it's happening with a lot of these other stressors. And a lot of the actions that you would take to um, help alleviate conditions for coastal acidification also have benefits in other ways in reducing nutrients. So you reduce eutrophication, you reduce uh, dead zones and, and low oxygen areas. So a lot of the actions, you know, can provide benefits for for a lot of different issues. Um, so I am a firm advocate for, um, you know, taking this approach where you do an action and it provides a win for a lot of different um, environmental areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, our next question um, was asking about any data that shows ocean acidification um, having effects in deeper offshore species like scallops. Um, and I guess going off of that, is there any, um, like is it easier to get um, policymakers more on board kind of with nearshore things versus offshore things and how does that kind of tying into those worldwide efforts kind of where's the mm -hmm. line there of what can be done on a state level versus a larger level? That's, there's a lot packed in that question. Um, I'm going to start with the second half of the question first. Um, I think that the um, the, the question of, you know, what appeals more, it, it absolutely depends on who you're talking to. Um, you know, I there was an interesting study or an interesting uh, instance that my colleagues here at Ocean Conservancy told me about where there's a particular member of Congress, um, not a champion of climate change, uh, you know, not going to be doing anything on climate change anytime soon, but this particular member loves sea turtles. And so that is a door into talking about ocean issues with this particular member. And um, so I think things, you know, it's sort of policymakers are as individual as, as everyone else. And uh, something that piques somebody's interest might be for an entirely, um, you know, unpredictable reason. So uh, I think it's hard to generalize there. Um, but I think it's important to kind of consider who you're talking to and what their area of influence is. If you're talking to someone with jurisdiction over local, um, you know, stormwater runoff, um, you know, lamenting the state of the international uh, efforts to curb carbon dioxide is probably not the way to feel like you're both making a difference. Um, and then uh, regarding the scallop thing, um, there is a great deal of effort focused specifically on um, the sea scallop that's harvested in the U.S. right now. Um, there's been a good deal of, of sort of um, modeling projection work over the years on that. And there are some, um, some um, in, uh, uh, studies uh, with the animals uh, themselves right now that are um, 
you know, underway. The challenge with some of the more offshore species and the more deep sea species is that they're really hard to keep in the lab and then, you know, do a decent experiment on, you know, so keeping them happy in the lab and then perturbing them can be just a really difficult challenge. So um, more to be, uh, more coming on that. Okay, we had one more um, question asking for your thoughts on the president's announcement of rolling back protections for waterways in an attempt to ease burdens <clears throat> on agriculture and industry. It, so the so my understanding is the question is is what are our thoughts on that ruling? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not super familiar with the exact wording of that yet because I've been kind of focused on this webinar and stuff. Um, I think in general we do need more of a, a handshake between um, sort of land-based activities and ocean-based activities. One of the things that I'm particularly hopeful about is that we see excellent coordination among those sorts of interests in the ocean acidification world. Um, for example, EPA that has jurisdiction over sort of upstream and coastal waters um, and NOAA are both part of this interagency working group on ocean acidification. And the individuals tasked with ocean acidification action in both of those agencies are looking for ways to make sure that their work more seamlessly interacts um, so I think there's a lot to be hopeful for um, because not only is the science pointing for a greater handshake between those, um, you know, sort of areas of effort, but we're also seeing uh, movement at the um, sort of implementation level um, to do that. So, um, so I find that, you know, whatever the headlines say, I still find that the, the folks who are actually doing the implementation um, are, are giving me hope every day. Beth, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, that's my impression too, Sarah, is, um, you know, these announcements come from on high um, and some of them are, um, you know, make a big difference. Um, some of them make a little bit less of a difference, but the, um, the people who are actually on the ground and dealing with these issues, um, I do think we have a, a way within the ocean acidification community um, to work across these uh, boundaries that uh, really doesn't occur in a lot of other um, issues. So um, yeah, I am um, cautiously optimistic as well. <laughs> um, okay, that looks like uh, all the questions that we had for today. Um, so thank you both very much for your um, presentations and your comments on these questions, and I'll turn things back over to Avalon. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anthony, for uh, fielding those questions, and um, to Sarah and Beth for pr your wonderful presentations, and finally to everybody that attended today and took the time to to learn a little bit more and ask some questions. And um, <clears throat> there was a re uh, request to display speaker. Um, contact information, so I've just put their uh, email addresses up on the screen right now, and I'll leave it up for a few more minutes. Um, and with that, we are we are just about at noon, so we'll go ahead and adjourn this webinar. But again, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to myself or to the, the speakers if you have any specific questions about their presentations. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Avalon. Thanks. <laughs>